Good morning, everybody, from day four of the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2016 here in Davos, and welcome to this press conference, uh, and welcome to everybody on the live stream as well. The question we want to answer in this press conference today is, what are industries facing uh, in terms of digital transformation? So it's at the very heart of the theme of this meeting, the fourth industrial revolution. And we're joined by an expert panel today to try and answer that question. So um, uh, let me, without further ado, introduce the panel to you. To my immediate left, uh, I'm joined by my colleague Bruce Weinald, who is the head of digital transformation at the World Economic Forum. Right at the center of our panel, we're joined by Paul Doherty, who's the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer of Accenture. And last but definitely not least, at the very end of the panel, we're joined by Eric Brynjolfsson, who's the Director of MIT Initiatives on the Digital Economy at the MIT Sloan School of Management, based in the US. He's also a member of our Global Agenda Council on the Future of IT Software and Services. Thank you very much for being here. And Bruce, uh, let me hand over right to you and ask you, why is the forum working on that topic and uh, what are we doing? Maybe you can provide us with some context, please. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Georg. So the World Economic Forum started this project a year ago on digital transformation of industries. And the objective of this is to actually analyze the impact of digital and digitalization on industries amongst themselves and across industries as well, as well as on the enterprise, as well as on society. And the idea behind this was really that the World Economic Forum is the one place where we can collect multiple industries and the public and the private voice and actually discuss the impact of digital, which is quite significant. And it is also very much anchored in the theme of the fourth industrial revolution, which is the theme of this year's, of this year's Davos. So what we did is that we actually engaged over 100, over 100 of our partner organizations. We engaged in over 230 subject matter expert interviews across eight industries and collected a lot of information on how digital currently is transforming everybody's life, both in business as well as in society. And we did this both from a perspective of analyzing a deep dive within the industries. So we analyzed how industries are changing due to digitalization, but we also identified the common themes and the common patterns and the common trends, which might have very different taxonomy in different industries. But ultimately, if you boil it down, it's exactly the same pattern, it's exactly the same trend, and these impact industries very much in the same way. So one of the key findings, or one of the assumptions actually going into this project, was that digital is very much a horizontal play and not a vertical play. And it is these cross-industry themes that we then discussed. It was the theme around digital consumption. How is digital changing consumption patterns, both in a B2B as well in a B2C world? It was a digital enterprise, so if you think of digital consumption as the demand side of things, then the digital enterprise has to respond to this demand. It's the supply side of things. How do your products and services remain relevant? How do you set your organization up and what decisions do you make? The third topic that we had was the impact on society. And there really we did some fantastic work, some um, pioneering valuations, and we tried to look at the value at stake of digitalization for business as well as for society. And the fourth topic was on platform governance, and that is very much the discussion around scale versus monopoly, the benefit of the platforms that are out there at a global level, at a pan-industry level, at an industry level, versus the consumer, um, consumer interests. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Paul, let me ask you, at Accenture, uh, you're, you're probably uh, lending a hand to many of the companies uh, represented here in Davos to, to, to succeed in the digital transformation. So um, how is it, how's it going? Uh, are you optimistic that they're, that they're going to succeed? Yeah, uh, very, very optimistic, and uh, we were uh, very proud and pleased to have partnered with the uh, World Economic Forum on the digital transformation of industries work. And if I look at the, the broader arc of this that we see in the, uh, in, the, in the world overall is that, you know, if I look back a couple of years, the discussions that we were having with, uh, with, uh, with leaders was around digital. They were, what is digital? They were, tr there was, they were uh, trying to learn more about it. Uh, if I look back even to last year in Davos and you know, last year, about a year ago, the discussions we were having with clients was, again, it's still trying to learn what it is and see how the digital effects spreading through some industries, through, you know, through the uh, media industry, through the music industry, et cetera. People try to learn from that and see how it applies to their business. Where we are today is very different. I think the lead with the fourth industrial revolution and the theme of Davos here has really captured it and that the fourth industrial revolution is really about the digital transformation of industries for business and for society. And those are all very important words. And leaders here in Davos, you know, what we're seeing this week, 
are now, they're not learning, looking to learn about it. They're not looking to observe passively. What we're seeing uh, in our business uh, uh, globally, as well as here in Davos, is that leaders are engaging and they're transforming their organizations. They're transforming their businesses or their, or their organizations to take advantage of the digital opportunity, but they're looking for the roadmap. They're looking for the guidance on how to transform. And I think that's the power of what, uh, what Bruce just described and the work that's been laid out here initially. The, um, uh, you know, the, the powerful uh, implication here is that this is about business and society. And the digital transformation, um, as I'm sure Eric, Eric will talk about, it, it's, a, it's really a once, in a, 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 my, once in a generation, certainly maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity for a transformation driven by technology that we're seeing. And it's a big prize that we see. And one of the things that, uh, that we've done, uh, that the team has done with, the, with this research is look to quantify the impact. And the, and the impact is big. We see a, a $100 trillion impact over the next 10 years. Uh, an opportunity created by, uh, by digital. But that's across uh, business and society, and that's a really fundamental point that we might want to come back to, which is uh, of, of the $100 trillion opportunity, most of that is societal benefit, not direct business uh, benefit, which is why the areas that Bruce just talked about, the four horizontal themes, are critically important for us to work on to look at how we can take this from you know, uh, take this from what the leaders are trying to do within their organizations to look at the, the, what we need to do across industries, within ecosystems, across stakeholders with governments and regulators to really maximize the share of that 100, and tri 100 trillion that does really, uh, that does really accrue in a positive way to business, society, and, and improving the world overall. And what, the, what this report really provides, and I'd encourage everybody to really read the research because there's a lot of depth there, is the North Star around how do, we, how do we guide and align the efforts that we're doing and align the discussions that we're having across organizations so that this does accrue and the benefit accrues in a positive way uh, to project the impact that we see uh, being possible for business and society. Thank you, Paul. Eric, over to you. You're representing one of the most prestigious uh, uh, institutions of, of higher education. What's your perspective, uh, particularly from there, uh, on, the, on the digital uh, transformation? Do you share the optimism of Paul? I share the optimism. I mean, there's certainly a lot of challenges ahead of us as well, but ultimately we have an, an, uh, far power, more powerful tools at our disposal than ever before. You know, there was a time not that long ago where people p talked about you know, the, the digital industries and, and maybe they focused on the internet or the software industry. But the reality is, is that now all industries are becoming digital. Whether you're in finance or retailing, you see that the biggest, uh, most successful competitors are, are increasingly digital. Whether you're in manufacturing, as well as in different functions, in, in marketing and human resource. Um, each of these areas, uh, digital technologies are becoming the core value creators. Uh, in Mark Andreessen's evocative term, software is eating the world. And that means that some of those basic economics that we saw in the, in the pure digital industries earlier, you know, a very low marginal costs, a kind of, a, I'd call it a Schumpeterian competition where you have to compete much more aggressively. The, you can rise very quickly if you've got a superior product and you leverage it using a digital platform, but you can also uh, fail just as quickly if a competitor um, comes out with a product with higher quality or that suits customer needs more uh, easily. So you can't count on the sort of uh, slower, more stable kind of world that we used to have. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the pure digital industries have, were experiencing this uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but that's coming to every industry. And no one's going to be able to hide from it. No one should want to hide from it. Uh, it's good news if you do have a superior product, a su superior uh, customer value proposition. It's not so good news if you're not. You're not going to be able to hide the way that you once were able to. Um, but the other thing that, that's important to bear in mind is that there are some big challenges, as, as, I, as I alluded to. Um, this doesn't come automatically. It's not like you can go out and just buy you know, a digital strategy off the shelf or digital technology and be done with it. Uh, in, in fact, um, most of the real transformation comes in reinventing your business processes, your strategy, we, the way you organize your company. Uh, the technology is a catalyst for all that, and it makes it possible to do things you could never do before. But, it, but in our research at MIT, we found that, that uh, up to nine-tenths of the cost and the effort and ultimately the value comes from that transformation of business processes and organizations that's enabled by the technology. And in a way, this is actually an old story. If you go back to, say, electricity, when it was implemented in, in companies, we saw that um, 
that it took up to about 30 years for companies to reinvent their business processes to take advantage of that technology. And these digital technologies are no less revolutionary and require at least as big a transformation of, of organizations and processes. Thank you, Eric. Um, Paul, you want to add to that? Yeah, it, I think the, uh, the way Eric framed the, uh, the challenges is, is very important because that's what this is all about, is how do we work together to enhance uh, and accelerate the benefits. And the, uh, you know, the challenges come into t two different categories, challenges that business leaders uh, need to ad address within their organizations. And that's uh, one of the challenges there is how do, you, how do you deal with disruptive innovation in your business and manage the, the cycles through innovation, uh, the you know, culture, and, culture and skills, the culture of the organization is something that uh, many companies are, are focused on, including ourselves, in terms of creating a culture that is more digital, that's more agile, that's more uh, able to move with the speed and flexibility that's required in the in the digital economy. So those are the types of things business leaders are are, grapp are, are grappling with and are starting to, to transform in their organizations. And then from a societal perspective, uh, we need to rethink you know some things. Uh, for example. As we look in, in certain, uh, certain areas, the incentives aren't aligned properly. We need to look at the way uh, policies and regulations are formed in, in some of these areas. To give one example, think of the automotive industry. The, um, uh, the research that we've done shows that uh, when you look at the, the benefits to the automotive industry, there is uh, benefits of you know, somewhere you know, a little bit less than a trillion dollars that we see to the, to the businesses, to the, you know, the, the, the companies uh, in the automotive industry, but a much higher value of uh, in the multiple billions of, uh, multiple trillions of dollars uh, that are the societal benefits that will accrue. And that's in, in areas like uh, better safety. Uh, it's uh, less, uh, less, less lives lost due to traffic accidents and such. And then if you look at how the technology is being deployed, and you look at telematics for uh, usage-based insurance policies and such, the nature of the current economic opportunity for an industry, in this case insurance, isn't really leading to the broad adoption of telematics across the automotive industry at the pace and scale that will, that will get us those societal benefits at the pace that we re would really look to get them. So that's what we mean by incentive alignment. I think those types of issues are very important for us to address across, you know, across our, our bu business organizations and industries, but also with the uh, appropriate government and policymakers. Thank you, Paul. Um, let me let me follow up on your question there, and Bruce, you, you might step in as, as the forum uh, person here on the panel. Um, you mentioned the public sector, so we do have 40 heads of states here in Davos. We do have about 300 ministers. If you had if you had a, like a call to action or a wish list to, to them, what would it be? I'm I'm happy to step in. Yes, and um, first of all, I would like to comment on Paul's. Uh, just to make a quick remark on Paul's comment. Um, in this project, we obviously talked about multiple industries, multiple sectors. The impact on digital and automotive was one of them. And we talked about the benefit to society. And I'd like to illustrate that just with a very simple example. Um, the seatbelt, um, um, through this project, I got to be a little bit of a seatbelt expert, as sad as that might sound. <laughs> um, it sounds good. It sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> the seatbelt was invented in the mid 19th century, it was first patented in 1885, and it was made not even mandatory, but Saab actually as a company started issuing it in every single car and the other automobile manufacturers pu pulled along with it. It was made basically mandatory in 1959. That is 75 years later. Hmm. We look back now and wonder why on earth was it not made mandatory? How many lives could have been saved? It is not fathomable for us. Hmm. We're now in exactly the same situation However, as you said, the pace has changed. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be three generations further that are going to ask us, but it's going to be my children who are going to ask me, first of all, you still own the car in 2016, 2017? Mm -hmm. And secondly, they're going to look at me and say, you actually drove it yourself? Was that legal? Is that not very dangerous? Mm -hmm. So it is this kind of value to society that we actually quantified in our report, because as long as you don't have a common definition, a common denominator that you can talk about, in this case, we can save over 150, we estimate mm. that we can save over 150 lives through telematics by 2025. So it's, you need to have a common denominator to talk about these things, ideally in a measurable term, that you can bring all the stakeholders to the table. Which brings me to your question. I think it is absolutely paramount that we have a very open discussion between all the industries within the industries, amongst the industries themselves, but also that the um, governmental voice, the public figures and civil society be at the table. We had a session this morning where actually a public figure told us, don't ask us to regulate anything until we have a common definition. That is, I think, so important. We all need to have an understanding of what the common base is and what the risks and the opportunities are. 
and it was also Klaus mentioned his opening speech to the fourth industrial revolution. He talked about the fact that we're at a cusp, we're kind of teetering between hope and fear. And I think it is absolutely tantamount that the opportunity, that it is clearly perceived that the opportunity is larger than the downside of this. And as soon as then everyone starts moving towards hope, I think all these things, all these predictions that we talk about are gonna come true. And I think digitalization is really gonna just start blossoming from here on out and really benefit business as well as society. Thank you, Bruce. You wanna to add to that? Otherwise, I would ask you, um, so usually the Fortune 500 uh, uh, companies look at startups a bit with a, with a with, with caution, mm -hmm. but shouldn't they owe a big thank you to the startups for, for helping them to, to you know, move faster on the digital transformation? Well, we're certainly seeing a transformation. I, I mentioned earlier about the, the, the more Schumpeterian competition, and the essence of that is this uh, more rapid churning. And, and you see it in the, in the way that the Fortune 500 have evolved. The average age of the Fortune 500 companies ha has been plummeting. Um, and now it, I learned from Bruce that uh, uh, it's much quicker for companies to reach uh, $1 billion in revenue. I, I, I may get the numbers a little bit wrong. Valuation. In, 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 in valuation, sorry, in valuation. Yeah, that, that the average, these startups get there in as little as four years now. I mean, in, in terms of them being younger, it's not just the age of the company. If you look at the age of the founders, as well, and that says something about the way that uh, younger people are grasping the uh, value of this technology and understanding that you need to have new ways of thinking about it. So um, the older companies can learn from this. Last night, Jack Ma was talking about how in his own company, um, he has a real push to push down, uh, push decision making to younger people in his organization because he sees that they also are quicker to grasp these uh, uh, the benefits and the potential of the digital technologies. So I, I think we can, we can learn both from younger people and from the younger organizations. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, Paul, just to, to add on to that, I, I think the, one of the, 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 the phrases we use in the work we do with our clients is that it's, uh, it's moving from being you know, disrupted to being the disruptor when we look at the incumbents and the large organizations. And if, if this was all going to be about uh, startups redefining and building this new world, it would take far too long. And I think that's, that's not the realistic way it's going to play out. There's certainly going to be a lot of disruption and changes in the leaderboard in different industries. But we believe in many cases it will be the incumbents who are redefining their businesses, uh, transforming not, their own, not just their own business, but their industries, and driving that types of change. And we see a lot of changes in organizations as they drive to that type of goal. For example, one of the discussions we had earlier this week in Davos was with uh, CEOs and, and board chairmen talking about the need for increased technology savvy on the boards of corporations to help drive them in this direction. And there's a you know, widespread you know, uh, agreement that that's, uh, that that's needed going, going forward. Also, you can see large organizations in investing, uh, investing more in uh, disruption in startups and other areas. In the fintech sector alone, uh, the established large financial companies increased their investment in the fintech sector by well over 100 percent you know, year over year, and that uh, that pace is only increasing, which is their app, you know, which is showing the appetite to invest and innovate. And then you also see partnerships between you know, large established leading organizations and startups, as we've seen with uh, companies in the automotive industry partnering with Lyft, for example, uh, recently, and things like that. And we think all those types of moves, in addition to the real fundamental work of, of replumbing the organization and changing the culture. Uh, to be more digital and, and adapt these changes are the kinds of things that are going to help the, uh, the incumbents in their industries transform their organizations, redefine their strategies with very strong top-down digital leadership to, to uh, help drive into this digital economy. That was, if I can just mention, it was a quote that I also quoted this morning in our session from one of the CEOs. Um, you talked about driving, the, driving it top-down through the organization. And um, the quote was that a leader without a follower is mm -hmm. simply someone taking a walk. <laughs> and I think it illustrates perfectly that not only have we learned through this research that it mustn't be only the CTO, the C, chief digital officer, etc., who lead this, but it has to be a uniform voice across the, the leadership within the organization. But that doesn't necessarily also answer the question that if you believe in it as a leader, do three levels below you believe that? Mm. Three levels below you might well be afraid that their job function is going to change. Something is going to be disrupted. So you have to communicate very clearly down all the way through the shop floor that digital is important and the benefits of digital and to make sure that you're not just someone taking a walk, but mm. that your entire company believes in you and drives this with you. Okay. Could, could I add one point on to that? Uh, as uh, Bruce just mentioned, um, 
uh, mentioned the workers and the jobs and driving it through the organization. I think that's a very fundamental point and something we've looked at a lot in this report and other work we're doing has been a big topic of discussion here in Davos, which is what is the impact on, on the worker and, the, and, the, and uh, what is the impact on jobs? And Eric uh, may, may, may want to follow me with some comments here as well. But uh, you know, the view is this is technology is certainly transforming the way that, uh, that we work, but it's, it's not as simple about saying that uh, it's machines or people and that you know, one is going to, you know, that machines are going to replace people or there's going to be a competition between the two. What this is really about is using technology to improve the way people work, uh, using technology to improve the way consumers live their lives and, you know, <coughs> and, and uh, augmenting you know, the capabilities that people have to do their work effectively. Now, as you look at that, there's certainly going to be cases where where jobs are replaced by uh, by automation, which is something that's happened, you know, happened throughout history and the, throughout the other industrial revolutions that that have happened. And there will continue to be those displacements, but overall, there's a lot of opportunity for people to do uh, more rewarding work, uh, better work, do their jobs more effectively, use technology to upskill the work people do, and uh, we believe that's a big opportunity. One, in, uh, just a couple of statistics around that. Uh, we released some Accenture research earlier this week that uh, that had a survey of of work of uh, of uh, workers uh, around the world, and the, the conclusion was that by six to one margin, workers were optimistic that digital technology and everything we're talking about would improve their work, and by about the same margin, they also believed it would improve their job prospects. So there's an optimism in the workforce, provided they have that leadership driving in the right direction, mm -hmm. provided we address some of the educational issues, and provided we, we do what Klaus Schwab talked about earlier this week, uh, with, with a quote that I loved where Cla uh, Dr. Schwab said, uh, the fourth industrial revolution will redefine what it means to be human. And I think we need to think about human, we need to think about people first and how we drive this and enable people to accrue the benefits of the, uh, of the fourth industrial revolution and digital transformation. And uh, I think that focus is very, very important in the debate. Thank you, Paul. Well, let me pick up on Paul's point about, about the jobs because it's probably the most common question I get, and I'm, we're hearing a lot here with the fourth industrial revolution. And, and there, there's some important issues, but probably the most common misconception is this idea that, that the, the big impact of the technology will all be about destroying jobs. And the thing we have to bear in mind first off is that the technologies have always been destroying jobs, have always been creating jobs. Um, but the emphasis we should have is on how technology can enhance and create new jobs, not just simply automate the existing jobs. And I'm not just saying that from a societal point of view. Certainly that's important that we don't want to just focus on destroying jobs, but also from a value creation point of view. You know, if you're a CEO, um, if you're one of those, those rare CEOs do, who doesn't care at all about society and just wants to focus entirely on the bottom line, I would still say focus on understanding how you can use the technology to enhance uh, the products, enhance the services, make labor more valuable. That's ultimately not just good for society, it's a more profitable strategy. Uh, there's only so much you can squeeze out um, from the cost side, but on the revenue side, the top line has much more potential, and that's where you see most of the value. The problem is that um, it's just much easier and in a way lazier to look at your existing tasks and say, okay, let's take these tasks, what can we use technology to automate this piece and this piece and this piece? And uh, that takes a, a little bit of creativity, but not much. It takes a lot more creativity to think, how can we invent an entirely new way of reaching our customer? How can we digitally transform our processes and our industries? What new jobs could exist that never existed before? That's a harder task, and it's one that ultimately plays out often, therefore, of, often over uh, 5, 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. but it's the one where most of the value comes from. And so I would encourage uh, executives who are, who are in the process of digital transformation to put extra effort on that side of the ledger and not simply automating your existing tasks. You know, I'll just put one, one, uh, one example around that, as I agree with Eric's point, is that you take one sector in particular that we looked at, electricity, and uh, the, we, the, the, uh, the forecasts show a net, jo uh, a net job increase in the industry. Uh, there was certainly a lot of automation, a lot of uh, things traditionally done in the industry done differently, but new jobs created in their areas like smart grid management, digital energy, energy supply, and other, uh, other jobs requiring different skills, but uh, creating uh, job opportunities in a different way, provided we prepare the workforce accordingly. So we see those types of opportunities when you look at it on a sector by sector basis. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you mentioned uh, that with digital transformation, everything moves faster today. Uh, I'm afraid it also is true for our press conference. Um, let's open the floor for some questions. We have a microphone here. If you could state your name and organization, please, for the sake of our online audience. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Jeff Black. Um, I'm from uh, Bloomberg News. Um, thanks very much for your very interesting comments. Um, I, I've got two questions, and I'll leave it up to you who picks it up. Um, 
The first one is, uh, if we look specifically at, at manufacturing um, in advanced um, economies, I'd like to hear what you think needs to exist in terms of common standards for uh, software and common software platforms that everybody can um, access, um, things like data protection uh, legislation, other types of legal systems that enable these, these, uh, these changes to take place. What needs to exist in, in order for companies of no matter what size to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that this uh, technological uh, advance uh, offers. And my, my second um, area is when we look at the, the, the world's uh, major economic areas, so the US, Europe, and Asia, which of these would you say is, is currently best placed to be able to take advantage um, of the opportunities here, perhaps given some of the, the factors I, I just mentioned? Um, there is the idea that increasingly we're in a winner-take-all um, economy, so the, the first mover benefit. So who's ahead and, and who's lagging behind? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question on manufacturing and what kind of the common regulations are we need, the common uh, common platforms for I software? I'll just very briefly start. Um, you mentioned about the manufacturing industry. That's interesting because we had a conversation yesterday. Um, which, which industry is the automotive industry in? Is it manufacturing or is it a service industry? Mm. And um, some people in the room argue that it's a software business now rather than a manufacturing business. So industries themselves are actually being redefined as we speak. But to, to get to your specific question, um, as I mentioned, we are looking at platforms and platform governance and the benefits of platforms, which undoubtedly are driven by global platforms, which we all are subscribers to, but also industry platforms. Um, it is very much a question of scale versus monopoly. How can you make sure that all the benefits that you derive, which are through innovation, entrepreneurship, um, jobs, um, hours saved, the fact that I did most of my Christmas shopping, I hope my parents aren't listening, or over Amazon, it, it just, it's a reality. Um, and you just have to do that while taking into account the, um, the, the consumer rights and the consumer benefits of all of this. But maybe I'll let Paul, who lives and breathes platforms, respond as well. Yeah, that uh, Billy pointed out is that um, you know the technology. What are the you know, there's you know we question what's the enabler and what's the driver, but there's clearly an enabler around these platforms with what's happening with the cloud, what's happening in uh, in new forms of software engineering. The other they're allowing uh, uh, APIs and things that are allowing companies to uh, piece together and stitch together capabilities in a more integrated fashion. And I think there's also a lot to learn from uh, other industries that have created platforms. So if you look at everything from uh, you know retail and what Amazon and others have done there to uh, to the music industry, to, trans uh, to transportation, what's happening. And there's uh, a lot of lessons to be learned there that, that now need to be applied into other industries. There's forecasts uh, that suggest that there's going to be 200, over 200 industry-specific platforms created over the next uh, several years, including in manufacturing. And uh, in the, the need, you know, standards are clearly going to be a part of that, along with the security and data protection are the things you mentioned. And I think it'll be key to learn from industry to industry and look at uh, how we accelerate the adoption of those platforms uh, as we go forward. And let me, I agree with, with all that, but let me touch, t t take a uh, comment on your, your second question about the, the areas of the world that will benefit most. I mean, in principle, this is a much uh, flatter world that um, everyone is having access to the internet in a much more even way. You're absolutely right that increasingly we're getting winner take all, winner take most markets. So you see some of the, the dominant players being able to leverage that. But we're also in a world where you have much frequent frequent change, I alluded to the Schumpeterian competition. And that does, usually doesn't mean that you, you take on the incumbents head to head and try to do the exact same thing they're doing. You know, IBM had dominance in mainframe for many years and, and Apple didn't go and, and, and become the most valuable company in the world by, by uh, taking them on in mainframes. And I could go through many, many examples of these platform changes where a new winner uh, uh, emerged, you know, Microsoft and, and, and Google and, and these companies that are, that are dominant right now, Facebook, most of them are in industries and, and, and products and platforms that didn't even exist 10 or 20 years ago. So there's an opportunity there for countries and, and companies that aren't leaders right now to catch the next wave. And there are things happening in mobile and many other areas that uh, I think the space is completely wide open. And uh, it's going to be a matter of whether you, you uh, understand the, the potential of the challenges, whether you put in place the right skilled workforce, whether you uh, uh, um, have the technology infrastructure, whether you have the uh, 
institutions in your um, government that support the kind of entrepreneurship and innovation and uh, business uh, redefinition that are needed. Um, that, that in principle is wide open to anybody uh, uh, evenly and uh, I wouldn't simply look at what the incumbents are doing in existing industries today. Yeah, just to add, add uh, one point, um, uh, there, one of my favorite phrases from the week is, uh, the future is hacking the present, which I think is a fantastic way to look at the, the, the fourth industrial revolution, because we, you see uh, uneven impacts of uh, the changes that are happening. And uh, to, so to address your question geographically, there's a, uh, some research that we, we can share with you uh, for you to take a look at later that talks about the effect of uh, the, the enablers in different parts of the world. And we looked at it in three categories. We looked at, um, we looked at infrastructure, skills, and other enablers, such as regulatory and policy issues. And uh, you find that when you look at areas like the, the U.S., uh, the infrastructure's there, the policies, you know, the policies okay, the skills is a, is a big issue we're focused on in the U.S. When you look at Europe, policy, you know, becomes a higher issue with some of the, uh, uh, some of the issues that are being worked out there. Yeah, more work to be done. And when you look at uh, Africa, say, in you know, uh, countries, you know, regions of Africa, infrastructure becomes a big issue. And we've looked at the relative weighting of where we think the focus needs to be in different parts of the world to, to accelerate countries at the right pace to keep up. So if you're interested in that, we can share some of the specific data with you. But it's, it's kind of that, uh, it's not as simple who's ahead, who's behind, and what, it, what a countries need to do. We're trying to look at it at a more granular level of, at those uh, three kinds of enablers within the markets. Thank you, Paul. So there's still work to be done. I have to be the disruptor of the panel here. Um, <laughs> there's uh, the report on digital transformation that the forum uh, published uh, in collaboration with Accenture. So have a look, check it out. It's on our website as well. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.